from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. have been to the Library of Congress before? Whoa, just about all of you. How many of you have been to the Young Reader Center, which is where you are now? Most of you, terrific. So you know that this is a place just for children. We're different from the big library. We have our own collection. You can walk around when you're here at another time, perhaps with your teachers or on a special day when we're open on the weekends or on a holiday. Um, we have games, we have books for all ages, and we have, for very young children, a story time on Fridays. And we hope to see you again, maybe with your school, or maybe with your family. You are going to participate in a very special program today, and I understand that you have been studying recycling, is that right? <laughs> and Africa. So this is a combination of both of those things. One Plastic Bag is a special book by Miranda Paul and Ise, Cise, Ise, I'm sorry, Ise Tu, Cise. Did I get that right? Ise Tu. Yeah. And she'll introduce herself again <laughs> properly. Um, so, I'm going to let them tell you about their story, which started in Gambia, and they will first read the book. I also want to mention that this afternoon at 4 o'clock at the Bethesda Library in Maryland, they will be there with another program, and they will be selling their book. So if you have a chance to stop by, if you're interested in purchasing the book, you can do that this afternoon at Bethesda Library. Okay, Miranda. Thank you. So 12 years ago, I wa was a teacher in a country called the Gambia. And when I was there, I met lots of wonderful people. I saw lots of wonderful things. But one thing that was very different was that there were no garbage cans or garbage trucks to collect our trash. And the trash started piling up around this village and around the city. And I thought the problem was too big to fix. But then somebody handed me a recycled plastic purse and said there's one woman who doesn't believe the problem is too big to fix and she started recycling the plastic bags that are on the ground. I said I have to meet this woman and all these years later I have written the story of her recycling project and I'd like to share that with you today. The title of the book is One Plastic Bag, Isatu Sise and the Recycling Women of the Gambia. And I'm the author, Miranda Paul, and it was illustrated by Elizabeth Zunan. The book starts in Isatu's village of Njau, Gambia. <clears throat> Isatu walks with her chin frozen. Fat raindrops pelt her bare arms. Her face hides in the shadow of a palm leaf basket, and her neck stings with every step. Warm scents of burning wood and bubbling peanut stew drift past. Her village is close now. She lifts her nose to catch the smell. The basket tips. One fruit tumbles, then two, then ten. The basket breaks. Isatu kicks the dirt. Something silky dances past her eyes, softening her anger. It moves like a flag flapping in the wind and settles under a tamarind tree. Isatu slides the strange fabric between her fingers and discovers it can carry things inside. She gathers her fruits in the bag. The basket is useless now. She drops it, knowing it will crumble and mix back in with the dirt. Four goats greet Isatu as Grandmother Mbombe emerges from her kitchen hut. Hurry in before the rain soaks your beautiful Mbuba. Isatu scurries in and Grandmother serves spicy rice and fish. Rain drums on the creaking aluminum roof. I broke your basket, Isatu confesses. 
but I found this. Plastic, grandmother frowns. There's more in the city. Day after day, Isatu watches neighbors tote their things in bright blue or black plastic bags. Children slurp water and wanjo from tiny holes poked in clear bags. Market trays fill with minties wrapped in rainbows of plastic. The colors are beautiful, she thinks. She swings her bag high. The handle breaks. One paper escapes, then two, then 10. Isatu shakes sand off her papers. Another plastic bag floats by and she tucks her things inside. The torn bag is useless now. She drops it to the dirt as everyone does. There's nowhere else to put it. Day after day, the bag she dropped is still there. One plastic bag becomes two, then 10, then 100. Plastic isn't beautiful anymore, she thinks. Her feet step down a cleaner path and the thought floats away. Years pass and Isatu grows into a woman. She barely notices the ugliness growing around her until the ugliness finds its way to her. Isatu hears a goat crying and hurries toward grandmother's house. Why is it tied up? Where are the other goats? Inside, the butcher is speaking in a low voice. Many goats have been eating these, he says. The bags twist around their insides and the animals cannot survive. Now three of your goats and so many other goats in the village have died. Grandmother Mbombe's powerful shoulders sag. Isatu must be strong and do something. But what? Isatu's feet lead her to the old ugly road. A pile of garbage stands as wide as grandmother's cooking hut. Mosquitoes swarm near dirty pools of water alongside the pile. Smoke from burning plastic stings her nose. Her feet back away. Goats scamper past. They forage through the trash for food. Her feet stop. She knows too much to ignore it now. Holding her breath, she plucks one plastic bag from the pile, then two, then 10, then 100. What can we do, Isatu asks her friends. Let's wash them, says Fatim, pulling out Omo soap. Maram grabs a bucket and Incha fetches water from the well. Peggy finds clothespins and they clip the washed bags on the line. As the bags dry, Isatu watches her sister crochet. Can you teach me? Wow, yes. Her sister shows Isatu the stitches, then hands her a metal tool. Isatu's fingers busy themselves, in, out, around. Jira Jeff, thank you. Isatu finds a broomstick and carves her own tool from its wood. What's that for, Fatim asks. Isatu pauses. She and Peggy have an idea. But will their friends think it's crazy? Will the idea even work? Nervously, she explains the plan. One friend agrees to help, then two, then five. The women cut bags into strips and roll them into spools of plastic thread. Before long, they teach themselves how to crochet with this thread. Nakali gay bee, asks grandmother. How is the work? Danka and Danka, answers Isatu, slow. Some people in the village laugh at us. Others call us dirty. But I believe what we are doing is good. The women crochet by candlelight, away from those who mock them, until a morning comes when they will no longer work in secret. Fingers sore <clears throat> and blistered, Isatu hauls the recycled purses to the city. One person laughs at her, then two, then 10. But then, one woman lays Delasi coins on the table. She chooses a purse and shows it to one friend, then two, then 10. Soon, everyone wants one. <clears throat> Isatu fills her own purse with Delasi. She zips it shut and rides home to tell grandmother she has made enough to buy a new goat. When she passes by the pile of rubbish, she smiles because it is smaller now. She tells herself, one day, it will be gone, and my home will be beautiful. And one day, it was. And ladies and gentlemen, the hero of this story, Isatu Sise, is sitting right next to me here, all the way from the Gambia. She's the one who cleaned up her entire village. Can we give her a round of applause for that? Thank you. Thank you. So today, we have a little presentation about the Gambia and about this book, One Plastic Bag. 
and we'll let you answer some questions and all kinds of things too about the book. I can get this going. There we go. So you've seen the book, One Plastic Bag. But where is the Gambia? There's some information in the back of the book that I didn't read out loud for you, but we want to give you some of that information. So you can see Isotu's country is on the continent of Africa. Do you see how big Africa is? There are many nations, independent nations, in Africa, and you can see the lines that are the borders of those nations. The one that's filled in in red and circled, that small one, is the Gambia. It is the smallest country on the continent of Africa. It has about 1.8 million people. And 1.8 million may sound like a lot of people, but compared to other countries, that's a very small number of people for a whole country. And it's surrounded by the country of Senegal. Now, can anyone guess what flag this is in the blue? The Gambian flag, that's right. Isitu would like to tell you what the colors mean on the Gambian flag. The red color stands for the sun. The white little color stands for peace. Blue, the river Gambia. And then green, agriculture, because we do a lot of farming. So, the teachers, your teachers might quiz you later on that. <laughs> okay. So, let's talk about writing a book. So I told you when I introduced the book is that I first heard about Isitu's recycling project in the year 2003. Were you guys born yet in 2003? No. no, I didn't think so. Well, and now it's 2015 and the book just came out. So let's do a little bit of math. How long did it take from the time that I was handed a purse till now when the book is out? In the red, in the book. From 2003? Yes, 12 years. Very good. So 12 years from 2003 to 2015. So why do you think it took so long to have a book like this? What could possibly have taken so long to have a story like this? You know it wasn't that long. What's one idea you have? Yeah, writing pictures and publish. Those were some of the things that took a long time. What else do you think? Very, very good. I had to meet Isa too. If this is going to be a true story, I had to meet her. And so I'll tell you a few of the things that I did in those 12 years that have accumulated now and resulted in the book. First, I had to learn the language. So I lived in Gambia, and that is actually a picture of my classroom. Most of my students spoke four languages. And Isitu, how many do you speak? Five languages. I think that learning a language is a way that you can become friends with people in other countries. They can learn our language and we can learn their language. And so some of the languages or words and things that I learned were Wolof, that's Isatu's language. In my village, people spoke mostly Mendinka, so I learned Mendinka words. And then uh, people greet in Arabic and they say, Salam alaikum, malaikum salam. Would you guys like to try some Wolof and Mendinka and Arabic words? Yeah. Okay, great. So Wolof, if you want to ask someone, how are you, such as your friend, you say, Nangadef. Let's repeat that. Nangadef. Now to answer that question, you'll say, Mangifi. Mangifi. Very good. Now in Mendinka, if you want to ask, how are you, you can say, Abenyadi. Abenyadi. And to answer, you say, Abejan Durong. Oh, they're very, very good, aren't they? <laughs> so other things that I had to learn about was ways in which the environment was different in the Gambia and how plastic bags and other trash affected the environment. As you can see in Gambia, there are a lot of animals. Some of these animals are animals I don't have in my home, hometown of Green Bay, Wisconsin. 
but there are crocodiles, there are monkeys, there are goats, and you can see sometimes the animals, they really are friendly to humans, and so you can see monkeys on my lap there. But I learned especially that the goats had been suffering the most from the plastic bags. They had been eating them. And that is one thing that I had to learn about the environment and also about the climate. I had to meet Isatu. And so it took me several years from the time when I was first teaching there when I went back for some research trips to Isatu's group. So that was part of why it took 12 years. Then they had to learn about the women's recycling project. I watched them from start to finish make the bags. I interviewed about 30 of, of the women who were working on the project to ask them, what was it like when you first started? What was it like before you started? What is it like now? And they told me amazing stories. They told me some stories of how dangerous the plastic had become, not only to their animals, but to their gardens and their crops, which had stopped growing when plastic was under the dirt. But then they also told me how Isatu's project that she and Peggy had started, that this project was changing things for the entire village. Then, as you said, I had to write the book. And up there, that's what it looked like before it came into a book. It was on my computer, double-spaced and typed in Times New Roman font. And so I'm sure as you guys get older, you'll have to type your schoolwork. And that's what it looked like. But if you look at this, if you read what I had on the screen, it's not exactly the same words as what you see in the book. Because this is one of my rough drafts of the story. And I rewrote it about 30 times to pick the best verbs, to pick the best adjectives, to check it with Isatu to see if I had gotten things right. And then after I got it published, which I'll tell you about, an editor also went through, kind of like your teacher goes through your homework and marks things that, questions that she might have or things that I might want to change and make better. So that process took almost two years of writing and revising the book. Then I got what are called rejections. That means when I thought I was all finished with the book, I mailed it out to publishers with a letter saying, I've got this wonderful book about a real Gambian woman named Isatu Cisse, and would you please read it and consider turning it into a book? And many times I'd get back the answer, no, we're too busy, or no thank you, we like your book, but it's not right for us. And do you guys ever hear the word no when you really want to do something? Do you ever hear the word no? OK, it seems like some of you know a little bit of what it's like to be an author. And so I would work really hard, but then I'd get no. And there were times when I thought of giving up, especially this letter that I copied here. When they sent it back, they sent it not even to the right name. They sent it to my last name, Dear Paul. And so sometimes I felt really discouraged, like did I want to keep doing it? Um, but why didn't I give up? I had about 14 rejections in all for this particular book. Why didn't I give up? I'm going to tell you why I didn't give up. I have about five really strong reasons on why I didn't give up. One of those reasons is there are very few picture books about the Gambia, specifically about Gambian people. I noticed when I came back the first time, but also when I was teaching in the Gambia, it was very hard for me to find books that had what I call mirrors of my kids in Gambia, that they could see themselves in a book. Many of the stories that I found about Africa or about the Gambia were folk tales that were kind of sent in, set in ancient times. They weren't about Gambia today or Gambians today. And I thought, if I grew up never reading a book about someone in my culture, I might think that my culture is not good enough to be in a book. So I wanted to make sure that I could contribute at least one book to uh, the canon of literature that we have here in the United States or abroad that features the Gambia, because I loved it so much and I wanted my students in Gambia to have a book. But I also wanted students in America to know a little bit more about specific cultures in Africa, specifically in the Gambia. So. One thing that we've been doing is we've been touring through about, we've, we've got eight states, I think, on our current tour. We have a PowerPoint, and we do a quiz with kids. And 
All of the answers on the quiz, it's really easy, are actually the last answer. But we've noticed that when we get to the schools and we read this question, what do kids in Gambia do for fun? Play sports, hang out with friends, play games, read books, watch TV or movies, or all of the above, is that some kids get confused. It's that they haven't heard or studied Africa today enough to know that many kids in Africa have the same things that you have cities, there are cars, there are books and movies, and they really like to do a lot of the same things for fun as you do. And so that's something that we've learned in doing this tour is that not every kid knows much about contemporary African society, especially in the urban cities in Africa. So reason number one was I wanted to have more books about, Gam about real Gambian life. Reason number two was an environmental reason is that nowadays enough plastic is thrown away each year to circle the earth four times. We produce a lot more garbage now than people did years ago, like when, when Isa too was first born. So she noticed growing up that more and more plastic keeps coming in. These are photos I took in the Gambia of some of the plastic clogging up the sewers, or sometimes plastic piles, kids will pick through them looking for things. And plastic can be very, very dangerous to uh, people's health. How many plastic bag factories are there in the Gambia? We have none. We have no there are, so there are no plastic factories in the Gambia, but yet plastic gets imported into the country. And it's a problem. Everywhere that I've traveled in the world, plastic is a problem. It's, it, a lot of it is getting in our oceans. So that was a reason why I felt like I, I couldn't give up on sending this book out because I needed to show people the dangers of plastic. The third reason is that plastic is not just in the ground or um, in our oceans anymore. There's some scientists who have just released some different um, data or information that plastic is now found inside of our bodies. Is that we, we touch and we eat out of things that are made out of plastic. We have so much exposure to plastic that nine out of 10 Americans actually have plastic chemicals in our blood. And so that's something, we don't know what that means or maybe what effects that has. But I was just reading some statistics about that. And then this right here in the picture is my daughter. So I have kids and I think about my own kids. This isn't just a problem in the Gambia. We have plastic bags here. And we, although sometimes we don't always see all the, the trash and where it goes, we do have an environmental trash problem, and most of it is plastic. And kids and adults here and there both suffer from the effects of plastic. Isa too will tell you maybe one thing about kids and how they suffer from plastic in the Gambia. You know, <clears throat> sometimes what happens is in schools, people sell food around the school. And they, as you see in the book, they put wonder in plastic. And kids buy it and eat it. You know, kids, they don't know the limit of sweets. So when they finish with, this, with the juice, they keep chewing the plastic. And accidentally, it can drop to their stomach. And at the end of the day, they might, if they are lucky to have cooperation, you know, they, they're lucky. If not, you know, they will die. So these are all things that we, you know, put into consideration. Mm -hmm. So reason number four that I have is Isitu didn't give up. She is an inspiration to me, and an inspiration is someone who motivates me to want to keep going. I've known Isatu now for eight years, and when she started telling me her story of when she started, people laughed at her. You read that in the book. Some of her own family members asked her if she could stop her program because it's kind of embarrassing that they had someone who picked through the trash. But there were also people who told her that because she was young, and because she was a woman, she couldn't lead a project, that she would fail, that she would never make success out of it. And boys and girls, it was 17 years ago that ISITU started. Now she's had international awards. She's had the UN Development Program and Concern Universal funding women from her village to go teach people in the city how to manage their waste in the Gambia. And she's a very big inspiration to me. On the back of the book, Isatu provided a quote. And uh, are you able to read that quote today, Isatu? You know, when I started the project, so many people think that I'm too young to start a project like that. 
And at the same time, they were thinking that I cannot be a leader because I'm a woman. But I was like, this is a word that I had, and I think it needs to be changed. And if it's going to be changed, it should be someone who is going to be volunteer doing it and take the challenge. So I take it, I took it, and I, you know, believe myself, and I believe what I was doing because I understand that if we leave the situation like this, the next generation they will suffer. So I was taking this the, the, the channel, the, the challenges, and work very hard to make sure that it changed. And definitely now we see the impact; it's really changed. Thank you. You know, we have to believe that anything that you started new, people don't, they don't understand it. It's always difficult. But we have to try and make it happen. And so now you have five women on the village council? Yep, you have three in her village. so many women who are part of the decision making around where mm -hmm. I see. And the women, they, now that they are able to speak out and speak up with their ideas, they've come up with a number of new ideas to recycle other things besides plastic bags. If you look at these here, can you hold that one up? they look kind of rubbery and black, but this is not plastic bags. What do you think this beautiful necklace is made out of? What do you think? Rubber, right? This is made out of recycled bicycle tires. So when people throw away their bicycle tires and they can't be used anymore, they wash them up, cut them into strips, and make jewelry. And it's just a sample that we bring, but we make so many different products out of it. Mm -hmm. These are the plastic bags that we showed, showed you. But there's one kind of plastic bag they make that's very shiny and crinkly, has a different feel. And this is made from a product that was used mostly before you were born. And they're VHS videotapes. So VHS videotapes will make this one. The women also use cloth scraps, things from the beautiful clothes that they make. The cloth um, scraps go on recycled rice bags, so big sacks of rice. Instead of just dropping them or throwing them away, they will take the rice bags and the scraps of clothing from when they cut to make clothes, they will line the inside and the sides with the extra scraps. Because what we realize is, even the tailors now, there are so many materials that they're using to do tailoring, they are plastic. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, when they finish with it, the leftover, they will just pack it somewhere and burn it. So we are advocating for no burning mm -hmm. plastic. So that's why we go to tailors and you know, sensitize them about the project and give them our business card. If they have more leftover uh, fabric, they will just call us and go and grab it. And then this is a ball. Not all kids in Gambia have a soccer ball to play with. And so the women have come up with how to crochet these balls, and inside they pack all the tiny scraps of plastic that would just go out in the environment and the goats might eat them or they might go under the ground as they tuck all the scraps inside so that nothing goes to waste, is that they can recycle pretty much all of it that comes into the village. Because they, like the book said, there's nowhere else to put it. And so um, also we've learned since we've been here how to recycle the plastic bags and make jump ropes. So that's something that we'll do in just a minute today is we'll make some jump ropes. So there's one more reason here that, um, or here this is the women, they're dancing. We get very excited when there is, a, when there is um, something to be celebrated. And so that also inspired me not to give up because they didn't give up on me. They said, you'll find a publisher. Don't worry about it. You'll find a publisher. They would dance. So they were a big inspiration. But the last reason has to do with all of you who are here today is reason number five is that with this book, I can help and make a difference. And it, there's solutions. There are things that we can do to help our environment. And the first thing is, is we can add one more R to the three R's that I learned in school called reduce, reuse, recycle. Have you guys ever heard of those three R's? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'm going to challenge you to add a fourth R to that, and that's refuse. And refuse means refuse to take a plastic bag when you go to the store in the first place. Refuse to take something in a plastic bottle and use a reusable bottle instead. Refuse to buy things that are in plastic packaging that can't be recycled and try to buy that food in a glass jar or something that can easily be recycled instead. So that's refuse. That's something that 
everyone can do. And then if we can't refuse, if we have plastic already there, which is something that is part of our lives, one thing we can do is think of all the creative ways that we can recycle plastic. I have learned from talking with kids about this book, but also in my, future, in my former career of being a teacher, kids have a great imagination. You guys are really creative. And Isa too was young when she came up with her idea to recycle plastic bags into purses. So I have a board on the internet where I tag little pictures of creative things people have made using plastic bags. And I think that every single day I see new ones on there. So people are coming up with all kinds of creative ways to, do, to recycle the plastic bags that we already have. You can see you could even make a chicken out of plastic. I haven't tried that one yet. It looks a little difficult. I haven't tried it yet. So what we're going to do with you, and first I think we're going to do a little bit of questions. We're going to do a jump rope making activity in groups where you guys are going to get to make your own jump ropes. And we're going to demonstrate for you how to turn one plastic bag into plastic yarn or, or plarn. We're going to take one plastic bag and it's going to be one long string of yarn. So we're going to do that for you in a second. And then I'm also going to pass out for your teachers a recycled product idea contest where you think of something that you throw away and you think of what could I turn this into? So you do brainstorming and then you draw a picture of your idea and you can bring that home with you. And so I'll get to the jump rope in a minute. The contest, in case you don't get a form for some reason today, is on oneplasticbag.com and you can just enter, click the Enter the Earth Day contest. But I think now, Let's take some time to do questions because you probably have quite a few questions about the Gambia or the book. Okay, she's gone. Okay, with the pink. Mm -hmm. One comment, one question. Okay. So your mom is from Senegal, and she's there now, and so you know some Wolof. That's wow. fantastic. That's cool. OK, your question is, was, was Isa too born in the Gambia or the United States? Oh, if I was born in the United States? I was born in the United States, yes. Isa too was born in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Good question, thank you. Yes. I found out about Isatu when I was in the Gambia. I was teaching in a village called Farato in Gambia, and somebody handed me one of Isatu's purses. It said, Look, there's a woman who in Gambia who makes these. And so I said, I have to meet her one day. And one day I did. And then I, that was quite a few years ago. Good question. Thank you. Did it take, like, was it really, really hard to make the bags? What is that? Was it really hard to make the bags? Yeah, if you started it new, it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. But as long as you keep going and then you used to it, it's not difficult. Very good. OK. Yes. How long does it take to make a plastic bag? OK, how long does it take? Yeah, how long does it take? Yeah, it depends on the person and, the, you know, the speed of the person and then the time. Because the women who are making it, they are so busy doing so many different things. But if you have time, you know, you can make two a day or one and a half a day. One and a half or two a day. She's faster than me. <laughs> okay. Um, Does that answer your question? Right here. Can you take the microphone? When you made the bags, really? did you think it was a great idea? That's why I started it. I really think that it's a good idea. We have to start doing something with plastic. Yeah. OK. Um, can you pass the microphone here? How many people are in your group? It's 97. But seven, they're men. The rest, they're women. And how many have you trained? I have so far trained 200 and uh, 49. 
throughout the country. Wow. Okay. Um, pass it right up here. When were you born? When were you born? 19, 19, 1992. No. 1972, <laughs> sorry. sorry. 1972. Okay. Uh, will you pass it behind you to that further behind you? Stuff did you make? How many purses has she made? Or how many like stuff out of the material you used did you make? Like different stuff. How many things have you made yeah. with the recycle? No, we make Plastic. different different stuff. Like, like different like stuff. Yeah, we make stuff bicycle tires. How, how many different stuff? stuff oh, okay. Did I think how many and purses? How many of the numbers? Different. Of the all the stuff you made out of flat. Plastic. You know, we make this bicycle tire, it's out of plastic. And then we make the videotapes, it's out of plastic, and then plastic itself. Right. Then we have three different tires. How many? Also, what's the number of. He wants to know the total number you've made, I think. Hmm? Of all the. Of all the things you made out of plastic. It's a lot of them. It's unaccountable. Because we started with seven years today, 17 years today. So we make so many different products. I don't think we can yeah. give you a number. It's too that many. Ones. It's a, really a big but number. But I know we make a big number of mm -hmm. different products. Will we pass that to this girl right here? That's a good question. The girl in the gray stripes? Thank you. OK, you have a comment. So you see water bottles and plastic bags in the creek. Yeah. So what do you do about them? So you have to stay safe, yeah. but when you can, if you can, and your parents say it's okay, you can also be a steward of the earth and clean up mm -hmm. those things. Thank you. Okay, um, in the blue. The girl in the blue. No, I'm sorry, with the soccer shirt. With the soccer shirt. This will have to be the last question right now. Can I have your autograph? You know, that's really funny. You asked if we could have. I brought, I brought five books. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then Missy said, well, sign the book, but go back into your classroom. Good. Yes. And we brought a stack of signed bookmarks and signed cards today. So you guys will get autographed things. So good question about will you get something autographed. What we'd like to do for you now is a demonstration of how to cut a plastic bag into one long string, and then we'll, we'll get just started on the activity, okay? So we have plastic bags right here. This is a lot like what plastic bags look like in the Gambia. A lot of them are black. Sometimes you have blue, sometimes you have black. So what we will do first is to put your finger on the corner and then stretch it so that it will be straight. Okay. To both sides. And then you fold it. So she folded Fold it, it like just like this, in thirds, for those of you who are doing fractions. And then you cut the top. So she's cutting off the top, the handle's on the top. And then she's going to cut off just a little bit on the bottom. And then these scraps that she has here are what goes inside of the balls that they make. Then these you open scraps. It again. Like this. So now you have a rectangle, yeah. so you and then fold she it folds again. it. And there's a YouTube video that has all of these instructions on it, so teachers can go back, kids can go back and watch the video to know how to turn one plastic around, bag. See how it look like. She's leaving a flap on the end so that it will all be connected. Now, you saw the size of this one plastic bag. When she's done cutting the strips, how long do you think her string, her ball of plastic yarn, will be? Like how many feet? Yes. Eight. 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 Eight feet? Okay, that's a good guess. 
Yes, in the back. Four feet. How many feet? Six feet. What do you think? Five. What do you think? Five. What do you think? Three. Two. You could, so she's cutting strips now, but she's not going to cut the strips all the way to the end so that they can be all connected. She's cutting them about two fingers wide because that's the, that's the width of the yarn that she likes to work with. So she just cuts and it's not difficult to do. We've actually done this for you today so you don't have to do this part of the craft because this part is the part that takes the longest. Okay, so she's cut all the strips, like but you can see the plastic bag is still connected at the top. Put your hands, your finger inside to open it. So do you see what the bag looks like right now? It kind of looks like a skirt or a jellyfish. Um, and what she's going to do is she's going to cut a diagonal line from that first strip to the end, and then she's going to cut a second diagonal line from the second strip over to the first strip on the other side and then the third strip to the second strip, and the fourth strip to the third strip. So it's like a spiral that she is doing. If you guys know what a spiral looks like, that's the way that she's cutting the bag in a spiral pattern. So we will see if four feet, five feet, eight feet, we will see what is the closest correct guess. Okay, we're almost there. Two more cuts. So, ladies and gentlemen, when this is one plastic bag, this is how much plastic is in one plastic bag. It's generally up to 40 feet for one regular size plastic bag. So you can imagine what a serious problem this is. Okay, so I'm gonna get them started on the end. So what we're going to do now is I'm gonna go back to the activity here. Let me go back here. I know how to do this. Here. Here are the instructions for making a plastic bag jump rope. Okay, so this is a plastic bag jump rope, and what we did was we used those strips of thread. We cut bags for you today, so we did step number one for you on here, which is turn the plastic bags into long strips of plarn or plastic yarn. We did that for you. But what you have to do with the strips is you're going to have to measure, because in order for a jump rope to work, it has to be your height. And so you're going to measure in your group from one person. You could probably pick the tallest person in the group. OK, so the tallest person from the group is you want to measure from your chin down to the floor twice, like this. That's one strip. So you need to cut off 12 strips like this of plastic in your group. When you have 12 strips of plastic that are this long, then what you do is you take the ends of all 12 strips and you tie them together. And one person's going to hold them. And then the rest of you are going to separate them into three groups and you're going to braid them. And you can take turns braiding them. If you braid it really tight, You'll have a very thin jump rope. If you braid it a little bit looser, you'll have a thicker jump rope. So it doesn't matter either way. And if you get it wrong, it's OK. Isotu knows that sometimes you try, and you don't get it right the first time, and you'll just try again. So that's what you do. If you get all the way to the end, I have some tape in my bag, and we'll use duct tape just to make little handles on the end. So what we can do, I think, is maybe break up into five little groups, and we'll give each of you some plastic bag yarn.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.